So great to be here. <laughs> I got to meet this half of the room a little bit. Hi, come on in. Um, so I'm gonna kind of walk out here because I feel, oh, but now I'm off camera. <laughs> you see at the top of my head. <laughs> oh, good, because I'm looking up there and we're, okay, we're done. Um, it's, just, it's just an awesome opportunity and I especially like speaking to small groups and I hope that you'll write down questions and stuff because I'm really going off of the questions that Ann gave me um, that she wanted me to kind of go over so I, I just kind of put them down into my little list and jotted down some ideas so I'll put that over here so I can see that um, but the first thing she kind of wanted me to go over uh, my journey and the first thing that I thought of when I was kind of going over my journey nothing is ever planned in life has anybody planned out your life exactly the way it's gone? Any, I just would love to meet somebody <laughs> that had it planned out and it went exactly as you planned. Now that's slightly different from dreams. I love having dreams and my dreams changed all the time. I'm always telling my kids, this dream that you thought was the most important thing that I have to start volleyball team, I said in two years, nobody's even gonna care. You don't care, nothing. You're gonna have a brand new dream. So dreams change all the time. So when I was um, when I was about 14, I thought I was going to be um, an ambassador. And then when I was 15, I thought I was going to be an architect. And then when I was 16, I was going to be in piano performance. And I kind of stuck with that because I just didn't know what else I would possibly be good at. I mean, I just, when you're that age, you're going, I'm not good at anything. I'd like lots of different things, but what am I? I wasn't really standing out in anything. So then I go, um, and I, all I knew was that I wanted to do my very best at whatever I was doing. That's all I knew. So I want to get A's, and I was going to do whatever it would take to get A's. I just would study super hard. Um, but then when I went to BYU, I really didn't know what career I was going to pursue, so I did go into piano performance for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and I got there, and I went to my lesson, and, and uh, he wanted me to practice five hours a day, and I went, ooh, I don't love it that much. <laughs> So now what am I going to do? I don't know. So I just kind of kept changing. I went to international business because um, based on my background, one of the other skills that I had, I could speak Spanish because I grew up in South America. So I'm going, okay, I can speak Spanish. All right, international business. <laughs> I just wasn't sure you know, what I was going to do with that. So I switched over to international business. And then uh, that lasted about a summer or a semester. And then um, I switched over to communications because somebody said, hey, maybe you could do broadcast journalism. I'd never even considered it. I took uh, broadcast journalism 101, and the teacher said, if you get an A in this class, that means that I think that you've got potential in this area, and I got an A. So all of a sudden, oh, I guess that means that's the direction I'm supposed to go. But then something happened, uh, took a little detour, and it was just kind of a, a summer thing, um, getting into the Miss America pageant. I, I actually had never seen the Miss America pageant until I was in it, because uh, I just didn't <laughs> grow up watching it. I, I was down in Buenos Aires, they didn't play the Miss America pageant, um, and it just wasn't something that I had, had followed and knew anything about. But my mom had said, um, she had showed me this little ad in the, in the newspaper for Miss Salt Lake Valley. I was 19, and she said, um, you ought to do this. It's for cash scholarship. And I said, I'm not doing swimsuit. And she says, you know, in Utah, because she found out a little bit more information. She says, in Utah, um, they do swimsuit in private. I said, well, OK, whatever. So it, it wasn't, I, I, I was not too swamped that summer, so I got involved with that. And um, one must Miss Salt Lake Valley and went to Miss Utah. And at the time, Miss Utah was, in fact, I think it still might be, um, one of the largest, if not the largest, pageant in the country uh, in terms of number of participants. And so there were 65 uh, gals in the Miss Utah pageant that year, and I was uh, second runner-up. And I was thrilled. I was, wow, I couldn't believe I even got that much done. So, um, so I went with that and was done. And one of the judges called me up. Uh, and, and said, you're going to be doing this again next year, right? And I said, oh, no, that, that was a great experience. We're good. <laughs> and, uh, and he says, no, you need to do it again. We just thought you were really young, <laughs> which I was. And so they talked me into it, and I said, well, if I'm not busy next summer, I'll, I'll be doing it. So, uh, so that's when I got involved again. I was 20 years old and won Miss Utah and went back to Miss America. And I was the, the youngest in the top 10 by about two years. 
And uh, so I was, you know, I was pretty shocked to, to win. And that was a crazy year. Traveled 25, 20, 25,000 miles a month. I was in five cities a week. I know, it got me used to my schedule now. <laughs> uh, but it was, it was a very tough, tough year. Um, I feel like I got a PhD in public relations. Um, and, and the first six months, I really botched it. <laughs> um, some of the things that I'm gonna share with you about, about some advice, um, one of the things is I should have started younger in developing relationships professionally. I was so young, I was still in school, I didn't see the need of keeping business cards. <laughs> How stupid is that? Because I was meeting all sorts of CEOs and presidents, but I'm just like, oh great, I'd write them a thank you note, and then I threw away the card. So, big mistake number one. Um, but then after that year, I uh, came back, went to school. Um, I was uh, heading into my junior year at BYU, and uh, at that point, I wanted nothing to do with communications and with journalism, because I had had my fill of the media. <laughs> and I didn't like most of who I interacted with. They were pushy and arrogant, and, and they never got the story right. Um, invariably, every time I would read an article, I'd sit there and almost every paragraph I'd go, I didn't say that, or what was that? You know, and, and it just frustrated me so much. I thought, this is what you have to do to be in journalism? No, I don't want any part of it. So I changed my major to English. <laughs> And then I changed again, uh, I can't remember, I think over to international relations. But then um, I got a job with KSL. KSL called me up and said, um, would like to offer you a job working in uh, television, doing entertainment. And I said, you know what, I'm really not interested in television, not interested in entertainment, especially to me that's just really fluffy. And, and I kind of facetiously threw out, um, you know, if you've got something in sports, then let me know. Now this is back in 1985. Okay, 1985, and women were not really in sports. ESPN had only been on the air about five, six years. And I had started watching ESPN and thinking when I watched Gail Gardner, how cool would that be to have that job? That would be really neat, because I love sports. I was very involved in high school, um, just playing lots of different sports. I was never a star, but I just really loved being involved, loved volleyball and track and swimming. And, um, so. I threw that out and KSL came back to me a couple weeks later and they said, how would you feel about doing sideline football? Now, my, my first thought was, I don't know anything about football <laughs> because I grew up in South America, I know soccer and American football is really unfamiliar to me. Um, but something that I had learned early on and, and just decided to stick with is that I never wanted to see an opportunity pass by because I was just too scared. Never wanted to see that happen. Even as a 14 year old, I remember um, my biggest fear was actually getting up in front of people. I hated it, but to be involved in student government or something like that, you gotta give a 30 second speech and run for an office. You have to do things like that. So it was like, do I pass up this opportunity or do I just dive in, suck it up and, and start working on it? So I didn't want the opportunities to pass. So I said, okay, knowing that I would dive in and study football like never before, <laughs> which I did. So I did, uh, I, I would watch Monday Night Football. I'd record it. I'd go back and watch it again, write down every questions that I had. I'd listen to the play-by-play -play and the color guy and and they would explain things and it'd start to all come together. And then uh, I would spend three or four hours a week with the BYU defensive and offensive coordinators and ask them all sorts of questions. They were fantastic. They would sit there so patiently and with the chalkboard explain the X's and O's to me. Because I first started out interested and as part of my job, I was doing the, the features and, and um, interviewing some of the players. And so that would be part of it. But then I would launch into some of these questions on the X's and O's and they really liked you know, that I was that interested in wanting to know about the game itself. So I dove into that and then uh, from there, but still I didn't really have a, a plan other than, um, and, and even a dream. I mean, I thought maybe I wanted to be on, I don't know, Good Morning America or something, but then I just kept going, you know, I really don't like being on TV. It's not, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm good at it, but I don't like it. So I really want to find something I like. Um, and it was just really hard to, to pinpoint. But I knew that I loved sports, and so I kept following that opportunity. So for three years, I did that with, um, uh, with KSL. And then, right as I'm graduating, I get a call from this guy I don't know in New York. He 
says he's an agent. And I'm, I'm, I'm on the phone with him and, and I said, uh, so what do you think you'd like to, to do? And he says, um, I, would like, I would like to be your agent. And I said, how much will it cost? And he says, 10%. And I said, I don't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, well, tell you what, I'll get you a job and then I'll take your 10%. <laughs> I said, great, you get me a job, fine. So next thing I know, he's flying me out to New York and we're interviewing with uh, ABC and with ESPN. And, um, and I was 20, oops, I, I missed an important part now that I saw the picture up here. Okay, so, <laughs> scoop back a little bit. So I met my husband, this is my husband, Bob. Because <laughs> I just saw it was supposed to not be on, but okay, there you go. So I met him my junior year, met him in Sunday school. It was a packed Sunday school class and um, I walked in a little bit late and he got up and offered me his seat and I thought, oh, what a nice gentleman. He's from Idaho. And so we got married uh, right before our senior year for both of us. And um, so then, then we graduated um, together and then headed back, whoops, no, got married. Then I went back to New York, got my interviews. Um, ESPN wanted to take a chance on a young kid like me. A ABC said, you need a little bit more experience. Um, so ESPN hired me for a two-year contract. Um, Bob and I went back there. He went to Boston University uh, for physical therapy um, masters while I was going to ESPN. We still didn't know what the plan was. Um, all we knew was that he was going to get his degree and, and then we'd you know, see where ESPN went, probably a couple years, no more, and then we go home, um, which we thought would be probably Utah. So then, um, uh, after the first year, so I'll share with you one of my, one of my mistakes that I thought was a, a big mistake, but it turned out to be another opportunity. Um, that's the funny thing about mistakes and, and failures and stuff. You never know how it opens up another door. I mean, it, it's kind of, it, it is cliche, but at the same time, it's so true, so very true. Um, towards the end of my second year with ESPN, I was asked to do an interview with uh, Roberto Duran, who is a Panamanian fighter, and he was, uh, <laughs> I knew nothing about the fighting business, um, but because I could speak Spanish and he didn't want to speak with anybody else, then I'm doing the interview with Roberto Duran. So I went uh, to Florida where he was staying, I did this interview, we did it all in Spanish. Um, then they wanted me to go out to the fight. It was, a, it was his second fight with Sugar Ray Leonard. So we're out to, to Las Vegas. Um, so the fight, um, fight lasted, I want to say, 10 minutes. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty fast. And, and, and he pretty much gave up, Roberto Duran did. I, I mean, it just felt like he wasn't even there. So then they wanted me to go into his trailer to interview him. So I go into this trailer, you know, everybody's, somebody died. You know, it's just packed in that trailer, and we had about two minutes to do this interview. It's live television, um, and, I, and I start setting this thing up, and Roberto refuses to do it in English. So I said, okay, he can speak English, but he refuses to do it. Um, so we have his translator, so I said, okay, here's how, here are, here are how we're going to do it with the, with the producer. I said, I'm going to ask the question in English so our viewers know what's, what I'm asking. Then I'll ask it in Spanish. He's going to answer in Spanish. His translator is going to ask, answer in English, and then we'll, we'll do it that way. And the producer is just frantic because he's trying to fit everything in. He goes, okay, okay, okay. But make sure you're, you're, you've got to be right on cue, and you have to do this just right. So again, there's like the camera right there, and there's just packed people everywhere, and they're, they're pushing me and everything. So we finally get the red light. We're on live television. I ask the question in Spanish, or in English, and then in Spanish, he answers. The guy answers back in English. For some reason, I mean, I just started noticing that there was just so much activity and, and I got a little bit nervous, but I knew that we had to just keep going and I totally forgot to ask things in English. So I started asking in Spanish and then he responded in Spanish and the poor little translator guy tried to get in a little bit of English. So he got in some English and then I'm going back and forth with him in Spanish and every now and then this guy is, is asking in English or throwing in English. And, at the, and then the producer, he ran around to where I could see him. He holds up this big sign, ask in English, ask in English. <laughs> so I'm just, you know, now I'm just sweating bullets. I'm like, oh my gosh, I've totally ruined this live shot. I've completely blown it. So we end this live shot. Um, 
Everybody clears out of the trailer. I stay in the trailer because I know I'm going to be fired. <laughs> I'm just, I, I'm sitting there. It's like I don't even dare go out. They're going to just, they're going to say, just go home right now. So I stayed there and stayed there and stayed. I was the last one out of the trailer. And I walk into the production. There's another production trailer. So I walk up there. And they're, they're already on to another show. Um, but as I go up into the steps, so these production, I mean, it's a big semi, right, that you go up. So I go up into the little the stairs, I open the door, come in, I'm getting prepared to clear out all my stuff. And uh, one of the producers comes by and he's going really fast and he goes, good job, Charlene. And he goes, and, and I just went, <coughs> seriously, seriously? And so then sat down with the producer and, and he goes, hey, nice call, you know, because uh, we didn't have time to do it both English and Spanish, so good job doing it just in Spanish, you know, so. <laughs> I'm going, yeah, yeah, I planned that. <laughs> um, and then the next day, I got a call from the president of NBC Sports and um, wanting to talk to me in New York. And so I went to go meet with him. And so the president of NBC Sports um, asked me if I would be willing to come work for them, um, along with Bob Costas on the weekends. And that was based on that one thing that I totally thought I had blown, <laughs> which was just so funny. But it, I mean, long story short, um, I went in there with my, my agent. And, and the, while the offer was, incredible and very difficult to turn down. Um, it meant that I would be working every Saturday and every Sunday. And that was very valuable family time and, and very valuable personal, um, personal time that I didn't want to be gone every single Saturday and Sunday. So um, I had to turn that one down. But it was just really, really cool that, that something like that came out of what I thought was the worst experience that I had ever had on, on camera. Um, so after after two years, signed up for another seven years, uh, or another five years on contract, and then um, because my, my kids started coming. And let's see, maybe I've got, oh, can I advance this from here? Yes. Da -dum -da -dum. This thing? This thing? Da -da. Yeah, because my laptop's not. So anyway, I'll, I'll keep talking while. This one? Oh. Oh, there's my husband again with a wax dummy of Tom Cruise. But I thought it's pretty good, isn't it? <laughs> but it's really good, isn't it? I mean, it's like he's his bodyguard or something. I thought it was pretty good. Yeah, well, this was in London, so I keep this one. <laughs> OK, so then I come back. Um, so my kids are now starting to grow. And it's getting harder and harder to, to work. So I started working at ESPN, or I mean, uh, uh, the tail end of my contract with ESPN uh, towards the end of the seven years and just decided I, I really needed to focus on, on my kids and being at home. So uh, I left ESPN full time, but I continued to work part time, um, just freelance for the next nine years. And that's when I would do things like the Kentucky Derby or um, the Preakness or America's Cup or just different events here and there. But for the most part, I was at home um, with my cute little kids. And then, um, Something else happened in life that you don't plan. And my husband was diagnosed with um, a liver disease that would require a liver transplant. And they told us, they told us this, uh, it would be between seven and 12 years. We caught it really, really early. So um, they said that it, within t seven or 12 years that he would need a liver transplant. Well, all of a sudden, I'm, you know, my life is mixed up again because I had left television. Now what do I do? What's my, what's my career next? I don't know, because now all of a sudden I'm thinking, what if, some, what if he does not make it and I get to provide for the, the family? I don't want to be flipping hamburgers. I want to have something, a career, that I can actually provide for my family. So that was the impetus. So that was 13 years ago he was diagnosed, and he's still doing great. So I know. Um, he's one of the outliers, they say. So that's really great. He's being monitored up at, up at Huntsman, but they're, you know, they say he's, he's doing really well. So, um, so that was the impetus for me to say, OK, I've got to take control of my life. The only thing that I know that I can do is study. So I'm going to go get back and get my master's. <laughs> so I knew I didn't want to go back into television, especially when you're getting older. The last thing you want to be is on television. <laughs> so. And I knew I couldn't do national television, and that's really where you make a good living. Local television, you know, you'd, you'd have to be one of the handful of, of star anchors in order to make a good living. So, and I didn't want to be up at four in the morning, and you know. 
So I went back to, I uh, went to the U of U and got my master's. It took me four years to get my integrated marketing business um, degree because I took one class a semester uh, while the kids were, you know, while I'm managing being at home. Um, and then I finalized everything when my youngest, oh, who's not in that picture? Let's see. Let's see if I have another picture. Yep, there he is, okay. So there's Jacob. So I got three girls and a boy. And so when, he, when Jacob was in first grade, that's when I went back to school full time, um, taking classes all during the day. Actually, no, no, what, when he was in kindergarten, um, I had two more classes to finish up and then I went to work when he was in first grade. So um, got a, a job um, with a, a startup company running their communications. I'll tell a little bit more about that later. And then, um, and then I went to work in 2005 with the company that I'm with now, and I started out as their chief marketing officer, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And this has been, I finally, here I am almost 50 years old, and I finally feel like I'm doing what I'm, I'm love, you know? <laughs> Other than the mom part. The, the mom part was the only, the mom and family part was the only dream that really, um, that really came true. Everything else, Miss America was never a dream. That was just kind of, I didn't want an opportunity to go by. ESPN, I didn't want an opportunity to go by. You know, just things like that. So, um, the only three things that I had in common um, of the skills that went from ESPN, doing football, to running a business now, um, and all the things in between, the only things that I had in common was one, I'm good at learning. So I'm good at studying something, whether it's football or whether it's the military, because I had never been on a military base before we started this program that I have been doing the last eight years. And I had to learn all the new terminology for Army, for the Department of Defense, everything. You know, it's the 96th Regional Readiness Command and the 75th Ranger Regiment and the 125th Striker Brigade Combat Team. And it's, you know, all these things that you're going, what? You know, it's a whole different world. Um, so I knew how to learn. Um, my communication skills, because from whatever you do, one of the things that I found out that if you can write and if you can speak, then you can do just about anything. And that reminded me of, um, I had an opportunity when I was Miss America to play in a foursome with Bob Hope, Johnny Miller, and President Ford. That was so cool. Now, I don't play golf. But, but I learned. <laughs> I, I had found out about two months before this tournament, this was during the Miss America year, that I was going to be in a golf tournament. And I went, guys, I don't play golf. So for the next two months, everywhere I went, I went to a driving range and I studied with a golf pro. And I learned how to have a good swing. It wasn't consistent, but I looked good. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I played golf with them. And, and I remember one of the questions that I asked President Ford, I said, when you go speak to, young, to, to the young people, when you go to schools and stuff, what do you tell them? What do you think are the most important things? And he says, Read, or write well and speak well. And do that and you can do almost anything. So that's what I tell my kids. I want, you know, we have little sessions at home when I'll make them speak for 30 seconds. I'll just say, I want you to just stand up and tell me about your day. Don't just sit down and mumble. I want you to stand up and you're going to tell me about your day as if you're presenting to somebody. I want to hear you. You know, learn how to project. Learn how to have some personality. Just feel confident. That kind of thing. So anyway, and, and we do a lot of writing too. And then third, uh, people skills. So um, I remember when I was 15, 16, I would go with my dad my dad was um, an ecclesiastical leader with the Mormon church. We were down in South America, and he would have me go with him on mission tours to visit with all the, the LDS missionaries down there. The very first thing that he would do, before he even started speaking, he would line them all up. So it might be you know, a group of this many. He would line them all up and check their handshake. He would check their handshake, and are you looking at me in the eyes? And are you smiling? You know, so that's kind of the first thing. So ever since my kids were this big, let's practice your handshake. <laughs> Are you looking at me? Good, okay. So just some basics like that. But, but during that Miss America year, I really learned how to interact with 
old people like my age now. <laughs> you know, what kinds of questions to ask them and you just kind of learn how to carry on a conversation. And, and you know, that is so basic in business. That's what you do the first half hour of a lunch meeting. You get to know them. And, and then you start talking about some business. So those were the only three things that I had in common as, is learning anything, communication skills, and people skills. Um, okay, so I thought I'd go over, based on Anne's questions, um, some of the, some of the uh, mistakes that I made. There were many, but I focused. <laughs> I focused, okay? One was that I was, I, I have a tendency to be very trusting. So um, I just immediately think that people are, are going to be good to me like I'm good to them. I just assume that they're going to keep their word when they promise me something. Um, and so I've had many experiences over the years that now I get to the point, I want everything in writing and signed, <laughs> you know? And I hate that because I wanna be able to just have a handshake and say, okay, I believe you. But there are very few people now in this world that will do that. Um, so for instance, one mistake. Uh, when I started with this startup, um, that's now a billion dollar company, so I went to work for them, and we were just getting started. There were only like six people, and everybody was in a frenzy. Uh, if, you, if you've ever been around a startup company, everybody's wearing every hat. So everybody's just doing lots of things. Everybody's trying to get things done. So the, the people who were starting this were trying to get me on board really fast, and I said, great, okay, I'm, I'm on board. Um, let's sign an agreement, you know, on what we're going to do. Yes, 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 we'll, we'll get to that. You know, we're just so busy. Um, you know, and then their legal guy, I would sit down with him. Hey, you know, I really need to get that agreement. I know, I know, but oh man, we're gonna go, we have to get this production going and stuff, and can you give me a couple of weeks? And, and in the meantime, you know, we would really like to get, have you get started. You know, I'm trying to be a team player. So that's the other problem. I wanna be a team player, I'm trusting. So I um, dive in based on his commitment that, um, that they wanted to give me a bonus of, uh, I think it was like 50,000 shares, okay? So that was part of it. And he just never got around to the agreement. So I finally said, tell you what, just give me those shares and we'll call it good because once I have the shares, you know, they're in my name, you don't, you don't take those back. So that's good, okay, I'm, that was the part that I was most concerned about. Um, is that, that that signing bonus kind of thing because I was lending my name and, and everything else to this brand new company. Well, um, about two years later, just for a number of different reasons, um, I realized that, that the people that I was working with, they, um, I, just didn't, I just didn't work well with them, I'll just put it that way. Um, they were very, very dictatorial and, and I work much better in a scenario like I've got right now. And that's another thing you know, for you to learn. Um, do you uh, like to be micromanaged or not? That's a big one. Um, I don't like to be micromanaged because I am very, very proactive in lots of things. And if I'm micromanaged and I'm doing lots of busy work, it slows me down. Um, anyway, so I was in that, that kind of scenario. So after two years, I was like, you know what? This, this is not working out. Um, and I found another opportunity with this. So I gave them my notice. Um, they told me they would sue me if, they didn't, if I didn't give back the shares. That was part of my signing bonus. And, and I mean, it was just, it was shocking. And so my husband and I are talking about this. Do we go to court? And we realized I didn't have a signed agreement. So I had no other recourse other than to give them back the shares, even though they were in my name, even though I'd given them two years. I started, I started this company with them. I got them up to speed help them get up to speed and you know, turning it into a, a big company. So that was, that was lesson number one. You would have think I, I would have learned better, but a few years down the road, um, started working with, uh, as, as part of my job, um, where I am right now with Story Rock, uh, we partnered with another company to do a product that was going out. Well, this company asked me separately to be their spokesperson so we did a whole separate agreement with them, a contract and everything, because it was not part of my duties. It was a whole uh, separate, um, more of a celebrity kind of um, role. So I said, okay, after about three months, it didn't work. Wow. Oh, I'm gonna time out. How are you? I'm gonna pause. Oh gosh, how are you? How are you? <laughs> Me, 
you. Good to see you. Oh Thank gosh. you for well, being here. I am so glad to be here. I love being with your students. Aren't this is awesome. Aren't and what a great fantastic. campus this is. It is a really cool place. It is. It is. I was telling you, I need to get to know the campus a little bit better, though. I was yeah. getting lost around. So, but uh, it's it's beautifully laid out and it's just gorgeous. Well, so, thank thanks you. for having me Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Well, I'm just here because I just want. I, I couldn't have this woman on this campus <laughs> so nice. without coming by and seeing her personally. But I hope you all know what yeah. a treat this is. This oh. is Wonder Woman. No, uh, no, 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 no. Hardly, and, hardly. Uh, I just I've, try lots of things. Uh, That's I've been a fan of hers for a long, long time. Oh, you're and, so nice. Um, Anyway, we're just very happy to have Thank you here. Thank you. And so great that Anne is uh, orchestrating this. And this is a really uh, <laughs> important thing that we're doing on this campus. Uh, it's a big initiative that means a lot to me personally. And anything we can do to help uh, give uh, a, a leg up and a vision for women and education and contribution in the community, that's what we want oh, to do. Oh, fantastic. So. Well, we're, we've got the same mission. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yay. <laughs> We're companions then. So. Yay, yes, yes, absolutely. Well, I don't want to interrupt. You're the real, you're the show, thank you. so, but I couldn't be here without well, saying hello. Well, so. I appreciate that. That's very nice of you. I know how busy you are. Oh, so. Thank you. Thank right. you very much. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank you. See everybody. Thank you. Okay, thanks. See ya. Oh, that's so nice of the president to come. I can't call him Matt, you know, just the president. Um, where was I? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, um, and then I'm, and yeah, I'm going to cut out some other things because I did want to share this with you. Uh, so after about three months, they hadn't paid me, and I knew that they were making the money, so they hadn't paid me. So I, you know, I'm like, I know that you're probably really busy, but you know, would like to follow through with this contract. And they just kept telling me, oh, I know, yeah, we're out of town, and oh, now my accountant's out of town, and now this person, and just one thing after another. Six months go by. And nine months go by and still nothing, nothing. And I'm still doing stuff for them because I'm keeping my end of the contract. After a year goes by and finally, and, it's, and it comes to a head, it, we realize that our partnership with the company too is in trouble with these guys because they just are not coming through with their part of the bargain. So finally, it comes to a point where I have to have um, a legal letter sent to them saying cease, desist, do not use my stuff. Um, you have to pull my image from everything, you know, so we're about ready to take it to a lawsuit, which I'd never done before, and guess what they do? They countersue me. <laughs> How do you countersue me? <laughs> and I read this countersuit and I'm going, can you do this? That you don't pay me and then you get to sue me? I don't get this. I was stunned and then I looked through the whole countersuit, the stuff that they put in there that's made up, like, Oh, um, Charlene made us carry all of her luggage. <laughs> what? First of all, anybody who knows me, I have one carry-on. I can't, no, I don't have lots of luggage. I mean, just the stuff that they put in there. I'm sitting there with my husband just going, how can people make up stuff like this and then take it into an actual court of law and use up the time and resources? So we sit down with our lawyer and it's like, if you don't drop the suit, they will countersue you, and it's going to cost you, you know, two hundred thousand dollars. I'm just, I, I'm still in shock, you know. And so I really had no other recourse than to just drop the lawsuit. Okay, great, you got a year out of me for nothing. So, mistakes. <laughs> I do everything now in writing, and I have been very, very careful about how much of a team player I am, which is sad because. These are, I think, good qualities <laughs> to be trusting and a team player and stuff. But now it's like, we're just gonna, we're just gonna go move on. Um, in fact, based, you know, so I've, well, I, don't know, I keep dry, I keep scooting ahead of myself. Sorry, I want to have like some continuity here. Um, okay, I'm gonna skip that. Okay, okay, I'm gonna. Okay, so right on. Okay, so, so mistakes, but, but part of making mistakes is that one thing that I've learned is that failure is never final, you know, and, and you hear that, and, but sometimes when you're right in the middle of the failure, you're going, the world has ended. Everything is just, you know, nothing is as it was planned. It's all come crashing down. And I've, I've learned from not only the mistakes that I made, but, but also when I was working at ESPN, one of my mentors there, 
Um, and he had no idea that he had this kind of effect on me, nor did I think that it would have this kind of effect long term and in so many far reaching ways. But I remember going out on to do a story. We went to a small town in Texas to do a story on a, on a young football player. And um, we landed, we got in there. I had already planned this whole story, how the story was going to go, the kind of shots we were going to do. I already knew that a little bit of the area. We get there, it's like a hurricane. There's no way we can shoot outside. Half of his family that I wanted to interview is not there. That everything that I wanted to do was not, I could not do. And I was getting more and more worked up. And this producer took me aside and he was, you know, probably in his 40s. And he took me aside and he said, I know that you've planned out this story. You've even written out how it was going to go. But he says, there's, there, how did he put it? Um, there's, you can find more words. You don't have to use those words. You can find more words and create a new story. And that he was so right. I just started going, okay, I had this story in mind. I'm going to totally switch it up. What's a new angle? And then we started looking at it from, you know, the um, dealing with hurricanes in this area and how the football team does things when things get hard and rough. And we just totally switched things up. And I go back to that occasion when I was, you know, 23, 24, quite often. In fact, just yesterday, something happened that, that I, I got a little email that was um, probably one of the best compliments that have, has ever been paid to me. And this is, what, this is what happened. So for the last five years, I've been working on a partnership with the Association of the U.S. Army between my program, the Remember My Service program that I helped develop, um, which takes uh, all the digital content from military commands and we turn it into their story. Uh, put it onto an interactive DVD-ROM, put it into a book, and every single soldier receives a copy from their commanding officer to thank them for their service. So for the last five years, I've been working with the AUSA, the Association of the U.S. Army, to develop this partnership. And finally, finally, we, we um, cemented the partnership last month. So, but, but the plan was, we had four phases, and phase one was we were starting with the most important according to the Army and according to everybody who's been around there, the most important division in the Army is the 1st Cavalry Division down in Fort Hood, Texas. And so we had already worked through some of the brigade commanders that they were going to be the first ones to get going on this. I already had a sponsor because we're, we're doing this based on corporate sponsorships, which is a very new thing for the JAG officers to allow. So we're doing something really unprecedented here. We're working through JAG officers and the, the commanding officers. And um, yesterday, oh, and, and back up. And I'm working with, that are on my team, I'm working with two general officers, just barely retired. One of them is General John McDonald, who just last year, he was the number three guy over in Korea. He was in charge of the Army Installation Command worldwide. He's a very well-known general, went to West Point. Um, and he has become a good friend, he and his wife. His wife is a brigadier general. She just barely retired. She's a one star. Um, anyway, so he had called the commander of this 1st Cav Division and started working through things, he calls me up right after this. And he goes, um, not so great news. And, and again, you know, all year long, I've been setting this up. He says, not so great news. And I said, what? And he says, um, the commander has not really had a chance to dive into this information yet. He wants to take some more weeks before he can commit to doing this. Well, we launched this in two and a half weeks in Washington, DC, with these guys as like the premier pilot phase. So while we're on the phone, I said, okay, you guys have heard of the you snooze, you lose mm -hmm. premise? Okay, I know that they're really cool and everything, the first cab division, but I need them to understand they can't just pull plugs like this. Um, we're still gonna keep them, but we're gonna put them in phase two, and I'm gonna go grab the 125th Striker Brigade Combat Team out of Alaska, and they're gonna be the pilot phase because they're ready to go, and they've already told me they're ready to go. And they said, Really? You can do that? And, I, and they said, what about the sponsor? Is the sponsor going to be okay with the dollars switching? So I got on the phone with her and I said, are you okay with the dollars going to the 125th instead of the first cab that we've been planning on all year long? And her dad had gone to the first cab and stuff, so I was really nervous that the dollars weren't going to be able to follow that. Anyway, long story short, so I got it and, and I want to read to you what the email that he sent me. It was just so cool. <laughs> I was just so proud of it. So remember, this is a, this is a two-star general, okay? And he says, um, very nice flexibility and 180-degree shift all in a few hours. General Patton could not have done better at the Battle of the Bulge. 
<laughs> so I was just like, oh, I wrote him back. I said, you have no idea. That makes me feel so good coming from you. Um, but yeah, we just, it's like, you know what? Nothing is in cement. Nothing is in cement. Unless it's your house, I guess. <laughs> and even then you can move, you know. So one of the things that I have decided that I love is change. I love change. I love, um, I love the excitement of coming up with a new plan when everything is all wrong. My, my daughter, um, my 17-year-old daughter, heading into her senior year at Viewmont, um, all her life she had planned on being in Madrigals. All her friends were going to be in Madrigals. This was, and at Viewmont, it's such a big school that you have to choose a track of like one thing. You can't do sports and student government and music. You have to choose one thing. So she wanted to be in student government, but she couldn't run for student government because then there was auditions for Madrigals and she wanted to be in Madrigals. So she auditioned for Madrigals, didn't make Madrigals. All her friends made Madrigals. She's been taking voice lessons for years. She has an amazing, amazing voice. So I have no idea what happened other than maybe it, she stood out. But anyway, so she's, we're sitting in the car. She had just heard about this like two hours before. It was, it was devastating news for her at 17 years old. All your friends are in one group my senior year. Who do I hang out with? I have no friends, nothing, you know. And so I just told her, I said, so Sarah, what would you think about going to a different school? You know, and her eyes got, got a little big, and I said, her, her best friend is her cousin, and her cousin goes to Waterford. And I said, um, and that's up in Sandy. And so I said, if I can make it happen, would you entertain the idea of a big change, going to a new school your senior year, that's crazy. And she immediately went, I love that idea, I love that idea. And, and, and then she says, but would that be running away? And I said, no, that'd be a, embracing a new opportunity. I think it's awesome. <laughs> and so, immediate, so we made everything happen within three days. She's going off to Waterford and it has been, and then my son decided he wanted to go too. And it has been the best change ever. Oh my gosh, she's been so thrilled. And it's just, it's been a, and I told her just the other day, I said, what would have happened had you not failed? You know, and I, because I've taught my kids to, uh, failure is okay. The word failure, not a bad word, because it leads you to something else. So I said, what if you had not failed? Oh my gosh, you would just, you'd still be going along in this one little track. And guess what she's done since then? She went to Waterford. She auditioned for the Caleb Chapman Music Program. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's, it's one of the most nationally recognized youth jazz programs in the, you know, in the country, in the world. She auditioned and she made that. So she, now she's going to that, she's going to Puerto Rico for the jazz festival and stuff. And I said, you never would have done that had you not failed. So there. So she's like, yes. And she's going off to D.C. for a National Youth Leadership Forum for, on national security. And just, and all because she did something really, really different, you know. Um, so anyway, I'm going to move ahead to, I'm going to skip some things. Uh... Bum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. I'm going to go right to advice. So here's my advice. Um, and I just kind of have just a bunch of little, little bullet points, things that, that would just stick out at me. Um, when you start something new, uh, dive in, and nothing is beneath you. I remember pulling cable at ESPN and finding um, duct tape to go fix things. Oh, speaking of which, I mean, that reminds me. So is it Michelle? It's over here. Michelle's got this business going on, it's just amazing, and you said your friend does things with duct tape, and that's just, your sister, that is so cool, D duct tape art, you know, and, and I bet, you know, you started off just thinking of things to do, and you just kept going, just kept going, and now you've got this great business, are you still, did you finish that bracelet yet? Um, I finished two of them now. Like two of them while I've been speaking, because she has an order she has to fill by tomorrow. So she's multitasking, it's awesome. <laughs> you know, so it's, you just, whatever it is you do, just dive in and learn and don't be afraid of it and, and nothing's beneath you and you never wanna be known as a prima donna, that's for sure. Um, be fearless. A lot of women, um, I don't know too many women who are fearless, oh, let me put it that way, fearless in the business world. But we are fearless in just about everything else. So just translate it. Because I think a lot of times women think that um, maybe I don't have enough experience in this 
dog-eat-dog -dog world, guess what? This dog-eat-dog -dog world works a lot better when you're going after the win-win, not the win-lose. And guys are so focused on the win-lose, meaning that they put their ego above everything else, that very often they botch things. I have been in so many situations. Um, case in point, so last month we had this massive order of about um, 10,000 books that had to be delivered to this fort up in Alaska, but we hadn't been paid yet from the entity that was paying us, and our company's just too little to float that kind of dollars. So we had asked, um, and I was out of the loop on this. This was our operations guy that was in charge of it, and I didn't get pulled in until things were like almost about ready to blow up. And so I changed that. I said, don't wait till things are blowing up before I get told about this. Um, but anyway, so, so he did. He waited thinking he was gonna fix this. Um, but the printer refused to print the books until he got paid. I don't blame him. I don't blame him at all. But we were trying to figure out something. So I get a call from, I'm, I'm up in Park City. It's my day off or something. I can't remember what it was. But I get a call from our CEO saying, okay, just before I go knock his head off, um, I, you have any thoughts and stuff? And I said, Who are you, whose head are you knocking off? <laughs> and he says, well, I got to go to the printer and tell him he just has to do this and, and get this book. Um, stuff done, and I went. Don't yell at him. Don't don't get his don't get him out of bent out of shape, and and I knew that he would. I knew he would. So I said, tell you what, let me go do it. Let me go do it. So I went down. I met the printer, brought in everybody to the thing, and I said, okay, bring me up to speed on what happened. I I know what their side is, but I want to know what your side is. So he told me everything, and then he told me something that had happened last year that one of our guys at the company had done that I didn't know about. Um, where he hadn't paid him on time. And then this guy says, you know, I just wanted them to communicate with me. I just wanted to know that they were behind on this payment because this other payment was behind. And our guy had just decided it was easier to not communicate. What? <laughs> so I said, oh, you are absolutely in the right. Our guys should have communicated. And then I said, um, okay, how can we work this out? Here's my challenge. These guys are having a ceremony up in Alaska. The commander is going to hand out these books in a week. <laughs> and, I, and I need to have them there because the family's going to be there. You know, everybody's going to be there at that time. But we haven't received the funds yet. And he says, well, when are you expecting the funds? And I said, they promised me the funds by Friday. And he says, okay, let me make you a deal. I'm going to print up the books, but I won't release them until I get the check. And I said, that's a deal. That's great. I totally agree with you on that. So we got him the check, we got the books, we did everything. But had my, my guy gone down there and ripped his head off, you think we would have had anything? <laughs> so, you know, I think guys get their egos mixed up in a lot of things. I know that the stereotype is women are emotional and guys are egotistical. Well, I see more of the ego messing things up than I see the emotion. Um, so speaking of emotion, I think women have a, a really uh, great ability to be passionate about what we do. And that's a great thing, because when you're passionate about what you do, things happen. So that's an important part of what you, whatever it is that you decide that you want to do, you know, land on something that you're passionate about. That's why I left that other company, the one that took my shares. <laughs> uh, because it was getting harder and harder to be passionate about what I did. They were, they were holding my hands on everything, everything that I wanted to do and get done. My hands were tied, I just couldn't get anything done. And so it made it harder for me to believe in what we were doing. And then I go to my company now, and our CEO is just like, Charlene, trust your gut. What does your gut tell you? So I'm telling him what my gut tells me, and he goes, go with it then. Really? Great. You know, so for eight years, I've been able to say, this is what I want to do with this budget. This is how I want to do it. And, he, and I get nothing but full support. And man, it makes me passionate about what we do. And I just absolutely believe in it. So, so passion is important. Um, being around people that you want to be around. One of the things that I learned early on was um, to completely remove myself from people who are discouraging um, and, and only surround myself with people who are encouraging. So um, because I call the discouraging people energy suckers. <laughs> they take my energy. I don't like it. So um, sometimes it's hard if it's somebody in your immediate family that makes it very, very difficult. Um, but, you know, sometimes you have to make some hard decisions. Uh, but at work, you know, 
uh, it took me two years to make that decision to get away, and, and I'm sure if that were to ever happen again, which it won't because I love where I'm at, um, then it would, it would be a lot shorter. It would probably be like six months <laughs> or something before I go, no. Um, the other one I've already told you about, be willing to constantly change and reinvent. Um, ever since I've been at that company, we have reinvented ourselves a good four times um, and, and in very drastic ways. We can just turn on a dime, but that's what makes it fun and exciting too. Um, communication, like I told you, communication, very, very important. Relationships, that's how you build the businesses. That, that general that I told you about, General McDonald that wrote me, I've known him and his wife now for seven years, but we started off just as as friends and just developing and developing and it wasn't till the last three years that they came on as and, and now they are they have drunk the Kool-Aid they are so <laughs> big believers of what we do but that's because a lot of it because they trust me we're good friends so relationships are, are very very important um, always have options the happiest people I know have options uh, that's why you're going to school <laughs> the happiest people have Educational options um, that take them in different ways, uh, and especially women. My sister, who is 60 years old, went back four years ago to get her undergraduate degree. Finally got that. She's getting her master's degree this spring. I'm so proud of her. She's 60, mm -hmm. and she's so happy because now she's got you know some different options. She had never thought of that before. Um, okay, last last thing. So going back to finding your niche, your passion. So when I went to, I went to Afghanistan um, in 2009, and we just went over for a week to meet some of the soldiers and just say thank you for your service. And we went to one forward operating base, uh, Fob Bostik, that was just five miles down the road from Cop Keating, where just two weeks prior, they had had one of the worst ambushes um, in the entire Afghanistan war. Eight of our guys had been killed. Um, and we were, uh, as we were sitting down to lunch, one of the soldiers came over and he said, um, there's a soldier here who was nominated for the Medal of Honor after, in this battle, and um, I'm wondering if you'd want him to tell, your, tell you his story. And we said, oh my gosh, would he do that? So he came and sat down with us, and for the first time ever, he told his story. And that's a very hard thing to do, tell what had happened. From his perspective, he cut out a lot of things. I've since read his story. His name is Ty Carter. And, and he had done very, very heroic things, running back and forth under extreme fire um, to help save people, to protect people. He was a sniper. Um, after he told his story, we took a picture, and then, oh, let's see. I don't know if, I, I hope I don't go ahead to, oops, oh, let me back up. Okay, well, no, I'll, so we're there. So that's Ty Carter. See that little blue thing around his neck? We are actually in the White House right there because he received his Medal of Honor four weeks ago. And Ty, so and that's my husband there on the side, so that's Ty and his wife. Um, but when he told his story, I mean, he had just lost a buddy that he had tried to save. He actually got him to the medical te tent. Um, he had been wounded himself. Um, but we got onto a Black Hawk, uh, and I had the chance to sit right next to him. And so we started talking, and um, I asked him how he got into the military and he said, well, I uh, was a Marine and got kicked out of the Marines for violence. <laughs> and he's telling me all this stuff and I'm going, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, well, what happened? Because he was just being really forthright. And he says, well, I beat up my, my roommate. And I said, well, did he deserve it? <laughs> he said, yeah, he did. But he says he got kicked out. He tried the civilian world for a few years and he says, I'm just really straightforward and people don't like that. They, they, they don't like it when I'm telling them exactly what they're doing wrong. <laughs> and so he says, I decided that I was really good at um, being a teacher and being a sniper. Um, and so he said, this is what he said in an email to me. He said, when I was in the Marines, I was a marksmanship, instru uh, marksmanship instructor and loved to teach. When I was teaching, it wasn't a job. I would go to work looking forward to the smell of burnt carbon from so many rifles shooting at once. Some people said that that's a little weird, but that just let me know that I was doing what I was supposed to. I had found my niche. And I told him, and he came and he stayed at our house. That's why we got to be really good friends. And he stayed at my house, and, and that's what he shared with, with my son and with our family. He says, um, you know, I'm just meant to just be a soldier. And we're looking at him going, 
oh my gosh, that's one of the most important jobs ever. You are defending our freedoms and our way of life. You are standing facing the enemy. You're looking away from us. You're keeping the fight away from us. We wouldn't be able to do what we could do if you didn't have that one niche. And for him to have found that, and he's so happy, he's still in the army. And he's not making very much. He's now Sergeant Carter, so he got promoted. But he's 35. He's probably making 25, 25,000, I think. Um, and I took him to Miss America, him and his wife. Uh, we went back to Miss America. And he sat on the front row, and it was so cool, it was so cool. Um, but you know, how neat it is to be able to find that passion and, and follow that, no matter what it is, no matter what it is, you know, but to be able to land in that. Um, well, in the interest of time, I will close. And I didn't leave any time for questions. I'm so sorry. So um, anybody have any questions? And we'll throw them in real fast. Yeah. Yes. I, I don't know how many. I, okay. Smart girl. Smart, smart girl. Oh, I was going to show you a couple of other pictures. So this was just last week. This is with a soldier, the guy in the middle, who's 91 years old. He was 21 on D-Day when he landed on Omaha Beach. And I had just taken my son to Omaha Beach this past summer. So we went down there and um, he said, did you pick up the bloody rocks? And I knew exactly what he was talking about because they have, there's mostly gray pebbles there, but there's some red pebbles there, and I took 10 of them. And anyway, so that was one. Oh, shoot, I wanted to tell you this story. Oh, oh my gosh, do you guys have five minutes? Okay, okay, so here's what happened. So um, about five years ago, I went to a Memorial Day concert in, in D.C., and I met with a lot of families of the fallen. And this is one woman that I had met. And um, she, she had just lost her son the year before. He was 20, 20 years old. And uh, she gave me his, his magnet. They have these yellow ribbon magnets with his face on there. And I kept it in my briefcase. And I decided, and I only talked to her for maybe two minutes. And I thought, someday when I go to DC, I'm going to go to Arlington and I'm going to visit his gravestone. So three years go by. One thing after another, every time I would try, they were closed or something. Three years go by. My daughter. Um, is part of a, a leadership uh, conference that's going back to D.C. And um, this was in August, uh, two years ago. And the director said, are you going to be in D.C. at the same time? And we'd love to have you speak to our group. And I said, great, um, let's coordinate it. So we coordinated on a Sunday, and he wanted me to go to the steps of the Capitol and talk to them there. And I said, you know what, let's go to Arlington, because I haven't been there, and I'd love to take them to this gravestone and kind of talk to them about the price of freedom. And um, at, he kept going back and forth, it's not going to work, our schedule. And finally he said, okay. So I got off the plane at like 4.30, ran over to Arlington still with my, my luggage, and I met them there. We had about an hour and a half before it closed. I said, you guys go up to the Tomb of the Unknown. I'm going to go over to Section 60 where all of our newest uh, casualties are buried. And um, so I went. Uh, they, they told me where it was going to be. I started walking down Eisenhower Boulevard, and it, I felt like I was the only one there. Everybody had cleared out. It was an August Sunday night. It was, all I could see were just these rows and rows and hills of the whitened tombstones. And the trees, the big trees, you know, a little bit breeze blowing. So I came up to the um, top of the street where they said to turn down, and I, um, I made a left, and I looked all the way down about a third of a mile, and I saw this little car all the way down at the end. And I got this thought in my head, that's his mom. And I went, no, oh, couldn't possibly be his mom. So, but I had the number, so I started walking down, walking down, took me about 10 minutes. Sure enough, I get right up even to the car, and I look over, and she's sitting there on top of his grave, and she's just writing, and I thought, oh my gosh, I can't bother her like this, you know, so I'm thinking I need to just kind of back away and just, you know, leave her to herself, and just then she looks up, and so, you know, now I, now I can't leave, so, um, so I said, um, uh, Christy, and she looks at me, she, she doesn't remember me at all, and I pull out of my briefcase the picture of her son, she starts crying, I start crying, and I just said, I met you three years ago, and you gave me this, and I came to pay my respects, and she is just bawling, and she says, come sit by me, come sit by me. So we start talking, sitting on top of his grave. She told me all about him. She said, um, ever since he was a little boy, he wanted to be a Marine. There was nothing else he wanted to be. And she says, I didn't want him to sign up, didn't want him to. Um, and she said, uh, but when, when he was uh, 18, he said, Mom, God wants me to be a Marine. 
She says, what do you say to that? But she said, I've been sitting here writing a letter to him, telling him that this is my darkest day, that, that nobody remembers, you know, that our sacrifice, nobody remembers him. And, you know, and then I walk up. <laughs> and we're just crying. And I said, after we talked a few minutes, I said, I've got 20 people here that were going to come down. Should I tell them not to come? And she says, no, 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 no. I want you to, you know, tell them to come. So I said, tell you what, why don't I go talk to them first and then and, and explain a little bit more background and then I'll bring them down. And uh, so she says, okay. So I went there and, and we sat on the grass. I was going to give them a whole speech about Washington and Jefferson and everything, totally changed it. Gave them a whole talk there and then we went down to visit her. Um, and we surrounded her while she's sitting there. And she gave a hug to every one of those kids and um, thanked them for remembering her son. And then she told them about the um, uh, tradition of putting a little pebble or something on top of the gravestone to let the families know that you've been there. Um, but you know, when I think of passion, I think of this kind of passion that's, you're all in, you're all in. He wanted to be a Marine in the worst way and he, he knew the dangers because Marines are the ones that, that kick in the doors. They're the first ones there. Um, but anyway, th this is one of the highlights of my life what, after this happened, you know, it was just like to be in the right place at the right spot, you know, was just, was just awesome. Um, okay, so I have some business cards and then uh, any other questions? And I'm, and I'm happy to stay a few minutes after for those of you who need to leave, because uh, well, I know you need to leave. what a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>